And it's my pleasure to just share a short word for us today. But I've been really encouraged by the service today because uh, there is some alignment to what I'm going to bring. And I believe the Lord wants to speak. I believe he has something that he wants to say today. This isn't just another service because it's Christmas, but I believe his word is alive and active and he's going to speak to us today. So I'm really encouraged. Also, uh, welcome to you guys online. Uh, So great that you're joining us and uh, good to have our children in. So... If you received a pack today with some pens and a paper, what I'd like you to do is to draw inside it. If you've already done it, well, you can draw it on the side of it if you can, um, to draw your best picture of Jesus in the manger, of Jesus in the manger. And then at the end of the service, so after Pastor Martin does the blessing, if you come to me with your picture and your pens, if you bring your pens back, for every picture that I see, I will give you some chocolates that I have here at the front. Yeah, I know, I know. Yes, yes, exciting. So if you come to me at the end, I will get them to you. If we have some adult chocolate lovers here today, well, you can take part if you really want to, but just so you know, priority will be given to children first. <laughs> yes, picture of Jesus in the main. That's right, Pastor Martin. He just, he's just checking. Look forward to seeing yours, but you don't get two. You'll only get one. <laughs> Great. So if you have a Bible... I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to read the first 14 verses of that chapter. Some familiar ones in keeping with the infancy narratives of the Bible and of our focus over the last few weeks. They won't come up on the screen, but I'll read them for us. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. And it reads, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Recently, you might remember over the last few weeks, I think about a few weeks ago, we had some storms hit the UK. And um, they said, There was a storm coming and there was torrential rain. I don't remember. It was really cold, really windy. And um, they said, Storm Arwen is about to hit the UK. And I remember thinking to myself, I've always wondered why or how do storms get their names? How does that happen? I really don't know. So I did some intense research. So I Googled it and um, I looked on Google and I just typed in, how do storms get their names? And a load of things came up. And generally, from what I understand, it wasn't anything profound. But my understanding is, is that if a storm is going to be particularly impactful or particularly strong, it's worthy of a name. So they will give it a name. So if you're walking down the street and a gust of wind goes past you, just be aware, it's probably not worthy of a name. But a storm that is going to be um, predicted to be impactful by the Met Office, it will. And I say that because it reminded me of something quite interesting that happened five years ago. Remember five years ago, the Met Office predicted that another storm was going to come and hit the UK. This was a number of years ago. And I remember it because the storm was called Storm Doris. And the reason that means something to me is because it was a month before I was about to get married to my wife, whose name is Doris. And I didn't know whether it was just a a coincidence that there was a weather warning of Storm Doris coming or whether the Lord was giving me a prophetic warning about what was coming into my life. I'm really joking. If you know my wife, Doris, she's amazing. She's lovely. If anything, she has to put up more with Storm Jonathan. So the prayers are probably more needed for her. But anyway, I don't want to make too much lightheartedness about storms. I'm aware they can be natural disasters and they can be really impactful and can harm things as well. So 
But bear with me with this, I'm going somewhere. Um, I read recently of an article or of an eyewitness account of a, a storm that happened back in the 50s um, in America. So a storm that hit the USA, and it hit particularly Philadelphia, and it was called Hurricane Hazel. Now, most hurricanes, they gain most of their momentum or their, most of their force is felt on the sea. That's kind of how it works. But they said, this eyewitness account said that this particular storm hit the land as if it was on sea. And it was absolutely devastating. I mean, it was crazy. Apparently, there were telephone wires going everywhere, branches everywhere, trees uprooted, leaves all over the place. I mean, it was absolute chaos. It was kicking off big time. And then, right in the middle of it, all was calm. They said you, you could have heard a leaf quiver. All was still. It was like there was, a, there was like a lull. And what people were experiencing was the eye in the storm. And that's the title of my message today, the eye in the storm. People were experiencing the eye in the storm. And even briefly, it was said that the sun shone through, even just for a few moments, in the middle of that hurricane. And then... Or oh, hell break loose again. The storm came, leaves going everywhere. People were scared. It was absolutely frightening. And the reason I share that with you today is because sometimes when we look at Christmas and the coming of Jesus, sometimes that can be considered similar or considered in a similar way as the eye in the storm. As the eye in the storm. I mean, the nativity plays and the cards that you see when we give them of Jesus in the manger, they picture it so well, don't they? All is calm, all is bright, holy night, silent night, and that's great. But make no mistake, church, Jesus came in the middle of a storm. Jesus came at a significant point in history, and there was a storm. You see, if I can just go through a little bit about what those storms were, not just before, not just at the time of his birth, but even before and after his birth, I believe Jesus came in the middle of the storm. You know, maybe we can go back to even in the Old Testament when God first uh, brought a flood on the land because every one of humanity's thoughts and actions were evil. You know, there was a storm at that time because of God's response to, the, to mankind and how they were. They weren't living in the way he wanted them to. And maybe then we can go to the time when the Israelites were in the wilderness where they were been delivered by God, but then they grumbled against God. They turned away from God and they worshipped a golden calf in the middle of the wilderness and therefore they stayed there for 40 years. You know, they were in a bit of a storm at that time. Or maybe then we could go to when King David established a golden era of the kingdom and it was said that there were peace on all the borders. Well, would you think that maybe there was peace forever? But actually, no. Because what happened was is that God saw his people then turn against him again, turn away from him, and then we eventually see later on in history in Jerusalem the destruction of the city and also God's people then later being exiled into Babylon. I don't know about you, but it sounds like a bit of a storm. It sounds like life wasn't easy at those moments. It sounds like God's people were going through quite a bit of a storm. And then we can even go to Jonah, who was called out by God and the God's people again were, were living in a way which wasn't right. And then Jonah runs away from God and he hides from God. And there are many more things I could share. But then when we come to the New Testament era, when it says that Jesus was about to be born, it says in the chapter that we've just read, doesn't it, in Luke chapter 2, in those days. So around the time that Jesus was born, in those days, in the days of, August, uh, of Caesar Augustus, they took a census. You see, in those days, church, we have to remember that it was the rule of Rome, or I like to call it the reign of Rome. See what I did there, the reign of Rome. That the Romans came and they were the superpower with their oppressive ways and with their pagan ways and with their heavy taxes. And what that meant is that a lot of people in those days, they were poor. They didn't have very much. They were taxed heavily at that time. And so just to make ends meet was a struggle. You see, I don't know about what you think, but I think there's a bit, there was a bit of a storm going on. Life wasn't easy in those days. In those days, it was tough. If you were rich, you were rich. If you were poor, you were really poor. And then when Jesus is born, after this silent night, this holy night, as we've just read, when he's born, would we think that maybe there was a time of peace? Well, you'd like to think so, wouldn't you? But then enter what I like to call Hurricane Herod. 
And there was a time where actually Herod, who had established his power alongside the Romans as well, in, a, in, a, in an amazing way, he was really powerful. In fact, he was called King Herod the Great. He was seen as a great king. But you know, it's amazing. Historians, when they refer to King Herod, one of the key characteristics that they refer to him is not necessarily his leadership, not necessarily his great strategy. I'm sure he had some of those things as well. But one of the key characteristics that he had was insecurity. You know, when you mix leadership with insecurity, it can cause destruction if it's not controlled in the right way, should I say. And so it was even said of Herod that he even killed his own wife and he even killed his own sons because he was so threatened by anyone coming to his throne. And so when we read Matthew chapter 2, when it talks about the time when Herod had heard that the Messiah had been born called King of the Jews... In theory, it isn't, shouldn't really surprise us when the Bible backs up kind of what history says or where history backs up what the Bible says, should I say, in, t- in showing us that this is actually in character with who Herod was. When he ordered the killing of innocent male children, age two and under, his murderous campaign because he was so insecure. And then we have the force of the Pharisees, as I like to call it, coming with their heavy loads on people, Tell them they have to live by a certain standard and people not able to meet those, those standards at all. And then we have also the religious elite, the, uh, the Sadducees and the high priests who all were all in actually favor of, of the Romans in some way because they were, they were given political favor and given power. But then the Pharisees, they didn't like the Romans. So what you have here is religious and political division as well. It's all kicking off. You see, I believe Jesus came in the middle of a storm. I believe he came at a time when it wasn't easy. And I say all this to help us today in this short message that we can forget that these stories of Jesus in the manger, and these are nice stories with the shepherds, with the angels, these are great stories and I I love them. And they are for children, I'm all for that. But we have to remember as well that these stories were written for churches like us today. So to ask themselves the question, what does the coming of Jesus, what does the incarnation, the word become flesh, What does that mean for me? What does that mean in how I should live my life? What does that mean in the midst of everything that's going on? What can that do for me? And I believe when we look back to that first Christmas or that time when Jesus was born, I believe the birth of Jesus can be seen as the eye or like the eye that was in the storm. A peace which passes all understanding because it's not a peace separate from conflict separate from struggle, violence, confusion, depression, all those things. But actually, Jesus comes right in the middle of it. He comes right there in the middle of it, like a hurricane, like an eye in the hurricane. He comes right in the middle of the storm because then it truly does surpass all understanding. It truly is a peace which goes beyond understanding. And my hope and my encouragement for us today, this morning, is that we don't actually calm it maybe there are some storms in this room today and online in fact I'm sure there are that we wouldn't come today and go this is a nice distraction away from the storm but actually you're missing the point if that's what you're thinking but actually you understand that in the midst of this Jesus the prince of peace the one that came down when when heaven came down to earth in Jesus is actually showing us that he is the peace the eye that comes in the midst of it and that we can receive that afresh today that we can know that it's significant for us and that it can help us and it can help us in the way that we see things. Now, I bet if I went round the room here today or online, I bet you could tell me of many storms that you're going through or that you've been through. Your storm might even have a name. It might be cancer. It might be depression. It might be covid Loss, grief. It might be racism. It might be some other form of sickness. It could be fear. It could be anxiety. It could be so many different things. Your storm may have a name. But you know what I love about today's service is that when we lifted up the name of Jesus, we were reminded today that one came who is the name above every other name. No matter what the name of your storm is today, we can know this name above every other name. And Christmas, I think, should remind us of that. That there was one that came, and then when he came, he grew up, and in the time of a storm, he grew up, and he was victorious. 
And that truly surpasses understanding in the middle of it all. Whatever the name is of your storm today, you can know there is a name above every other name. Can I invite the band up, please? Thank you. He is amazing when you think about what he came to do and what it means that he came to earth for us. And what we rejoice in is not that the storm has the last word, but actually I believe the birth of Jesus is a little bit of a reminder to us that actually God, in the middle of the storm, when he gives us this silent night, this holy night, he has the last word through his son, Jesus Christ. He had the last word and continues to do so today. And so, if you find yourself in a storm today, my encouragement to you is to hold close to that peace. To come to the peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm not saying today, although I hope this could happen, I'm not saying that you're going to be taken out of your storm, but in the midst of it, you can experience that peace that really goes beyond understanding. And know that God is with you. Emmanuel, that Jesus is with you. That in that moment where maybe the storms are battering down, that the face of the sun, the son of God would shine and give you warmth and would strengthen you in all that you're going through. I had a, a word I wanted to share with some of you today, which is that I just had a sense that there's a number of us, and this isn't a profound word. I'm sure it does apply generally, but I feel I wanted to share it. Some of us are just weathered. You've just taken a battering over the last year. You don't need to go through why. We can see why the last year might have been tough. But for many reasons, you just feel battered by the storm. But today, my encouragement is that you'd come to the peace, the eye in the storm, the peace that surpasses all understanding, which is Jesus. That you'd come and you'd experience all he has for you. That in his presence, you'd be refreshed. And he'd give you all that you need to keep going, to keep walking through. Not a peace outside of the storm, but within it. You would know a supernatural peace in your life. And as we respond today, I just want to invite us today. If you know that you need to respond in whatever way this replies to you in your life, those of you at home as well, why not respond as well? If you know you need to receive afresh that peace, Jesus, the Prince of Peace that comes, the incarnation, the Son of God, who comes in the middle of the storm and also can come in the middle of your storms today and you want to respond and receive that afresh. Why not stand where you are now? If you know you need to respond to this today, thank you. Great. I'm going to give it a moment for some more to maybe stand. Great. Whatever your storm is today, that you could know the peace the peace of God which truly goes beyond all understanding. Lord, I thank you today, God, that in this time we're reminded not just of some nice stories, Lord, but the profound truth, Lord, that through your Son coming from heaven down to earth, Lord, coming as a baby and then growing up to be our Savior, Lord, Lord, it is a profound truth today in our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you came, Lord, to, to earth, Lord, not at the time when all was calm, all was bright, but actually you came and because you came, we can experience that all is calm, all is bright today. And Lord, I pray for those responding here today, whatever it may be, whatever storms, whatever the name of their storms may be today, Lord, we thank you that we can receive afresh the peace that surpasses all understanding. The name of Jesus today, the name above every other name this morning, Lord. We come afresh, Lord, and we receive that, Lord. Lord, you know the storms here today. You know the situations, God, and we pray in the storm you would minister. That people would know your love, would know your presence, Lord. Not outside of it, but right in the middle of what they're going through. And know a supernatural strength through your spirit. Know a supernatural love and sustenance that only you can provide today. So, Lord, I pray for all those here today, Lord. Strengthen my brothers and sisters, those at home as well. Strengthen them now, Lord. Let them receive that peace, Lord. Let that peace, Lord, be received into their heart. The shalom. Lord, you said, peace I give you. Lord, receive that peace today in the midst of it. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.